So, uh, drama therapy. It's therapy that uses role play to help people work through difficult or challenging situations. Well, like therapy, good drama encourages us to look inside. Mm. It helps us to understand our own behaviour and deal with emotional issues. In fact, Simon was telling me earlier that Aristotle coined the term catharsis to describe the healing we experience through drama. Hubris, nemesis, catharsis. Well, it's all Greek to me. <laughs> Thought I'd do the joke this time, seeing as uh, Simon was being a bit serious. But what kind of problems does drama therapy help to confront? It's very versatile. Marital strife, uh, workplace disagreements, psychological trauma. Drama therapy is not always easy. It can be very challenging and sometimes tearful, mm. but it should always feel welcoming. I think you just described the pub quiz I go to. <laughs> you see, you should be saying this. Uh, now, I believe we're going to see some drama therapy in action. That's right, Jenny. Um, over here, we have two actors, mm -hmm. Daniel and Louise. And in a typical therapy situation, they would play out scenarios that couples can try themselves. Right. Um, now, in this scenario, Louise thinks that Daniel is emotionally closed off, but Daniel feels that as he's getting older, he does need more space. Guys? And you wonder why we never resolve anything. It's because we argue, and then five minutes later, you get upset and I have to back down. No one's saying you have to. But that's what happens when you play that card. It's not a card, Daniel. It's how I feel. Just because you're a closed book doesn't mean I have to be. <laughs> what am I supposed to say to that? You should tell her that... Sorry, that's... No, 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 that's fine. Do you want to jump in? Oh, me? God, no. Yeah, no, please do. Step in for Daniel. No, I, it's just, it, it, I've not acted for quite a while. Oh, um, I'm sorry. I hadn't realised you'd acted. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, just with North Norfolk players, a bit of acting, producing, directing. Most recently, uh, A Few Good Men. Oh, sorry. amazing. What part did you yeah. play? The Jack Nicholson role, so, Ooh. yeah. Yeah, bit of, a bit, bit of a tough act to follow, but uh, I just tried to do it sort of, you know, like... like the truth. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> yeah. So I so, so, so went higher and then I did the scoff at the end, which I don't think Nicholson thought of, so... Well, how would you feel about having a go at this scene? Um, yeah, sure. Why not? Oh, great. OK, um, Daniel, you step out. Louise, you're in the kitchen, you're making dinner. And Alan, just start a conversation uh, when you're ready. OK. Don't overthink it. Okay, yep, right. Mmm. Smells good. It's just spag bowl. I didn't mean the dinner. Well, you never normally come in till it's cold. I'm sorry to go on. I just don't want you to feel like I'm complaining because I want to spend time with you. Hey, baby girl. Just been out on my bike. My motorcycling's important to me. You know that. But you know the best part of the journey? <laughs> Riding that steel horse back home to you. Try it without the accent. Me or her? You. OK, but the general direction... Don't forget all that. Both of you sit at the table. OK. Now, let's just pretend that she's your actual wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I wish I could spend more time with you. See, I hear you saying that, but I don't feel it. Then we'll figure something out, but you're going to have to stop going on at me. I'm sorry if I've got a gift that people enjoy and I find very satisfying. I'm sorry that you don't have that because for some reason God didn't give you any talent. Shall we stop there? Yeah, that felt good. Ah, here comes my queen. Ah, Catherine of Aragon. Most, most handsome woman. I think she has some hair on her top lip. Really? I've never noticed, honestly. No, I can feel it when I kiss her. It's almost as if she Don't has... Don't say whiskers. <laughs> keep going, keep going. I only have eyes for Anne Boleyn. She has me spellbound. But the king is married and the church will not allow a divorce. Silence, Sir Thomas. She comes hither. Anne has a radiance that I fear may be beyond the bounds of marital obligation. Aye, she is fucking gorgeous. I'll give you <laughs> but to matters constitutional. <laughs> the Pope is the head of the church, and he will not allow you a divorce, so you can simply have it off with Anne Boleyn. The only it I shall have off is your head! When I chop it off, I put it on a spike! Uh... Silence, Sir Thomas. I am not japing around this time. Right, it's very difficult to tell with you. 
I shall create a new church, the Church of England. Your Majesty, I implore you to stop. Assess the damage. Take small steps in the right direction. Hmm. That three-pronged plan is most interesting. It is, isn't it? It can be applied to any situation. That's the good thing about it. But the king ignored this advice of his much wiser friend. He made himself head of the church and married Anne Boleyn. Thomas, why wilt thou not accept me as head of the church? I do not think it is a forward solution. <laughs> Put down that bloody loot! Michael, I'm just tuning it up. But chillax. Why do you defy me? I do not think His Majesty is thinking with his royal head, but rather with his regal... Thomas. ...cock. Thomas! And you're not the head of the church. Thomas! You've been a dear and trusted friend, but I will not stand for this treason! I have a message from the Pope. Lay it upon my table. Christ. Right, um, what's, 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 what's my next line? Where's he gone? Um, you, you are not the head of the church. Thomas, you've been a dear and trusted friend, but I will not stand for this treason! Shit. I have Christ. a message from the Pope. Lay it upon my table. <laughs> um... You're not the head of the church. Thomas, you've been a dear and trusted friend, but I will not stand for this treason! I have a message from the Pope. Lay it upon my table. That's the last one. Right, we're stuck in a loop. Um, uh, um, um, uh, your, your Majesty, we, we spoke of this matter. At great length. Where did we have such a conversation? I cannot recall. Why? Uh, 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 at Hampton Court in the car park. No, the gift shop. No, the, 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 the maid. Thomas! <laughs> Stop jabbering! Oh, sorry, sorry. I see you are thinking of asking me not to condemn you to death. Cheers. Please don't condemn me to death! Silence! I condemn you to death! No! I'll leave that there. <laughs> right, shall I just go to the Tower of London? Yes, that's okay. Good. Good morrow, Your Majesty. I'll just put my hat on. Yeah. <laughs> Take him to the tower! Unhand me! I'm Roger Moore! Oh, shit, I've done it again. <laughs> now it's time to return to Alan's sad stories. So things were going well between Gareth and I, but that was when our relationship took a twist that neither of us could have predicted. Shit! Shit! Shit, she writes, because... because... Gareth died. But I married his twin brother because he had a twin brother um, who was identical. He had eyes like a cow too. So everything was back to normal again. <clears throat> um, until one day I discovered Gareth's brother in a compromising position with a box of Quality Street. He'd eaten three or four in sudden succession and completely ruined his appetite for the chicken dinner I'd so lovingly prepared. I was totally crushed. It was then I realised that Gareth's brother had a chock problem. Nothing would get in the way of his addiction. The lowest point came when I found him collapsed in a sugar-induced coma in the bogs of Yates's Wine Lodge in Yarmouth. We cried and cried that night. I reiterated my love for him, he reciprocated his love for me, and we shared a chocolatey kiss that will stay with me forever. But it was then that everything changed. Again. Because... His weight had ballooned to 20 stone or thereabouts. When he came towards me to hug me, he fell on me and shattered my spine in three places. The police didn't believe him. And he was carted off to prison 
for GBH or attempted murder. I forget which. I still visit him once a week in prison and he tells me, Alan, that he tunes into your show and it offers him great solace, great comfort. Uh, not that the show is aimed at the criminal fraternity in any way. Uh, the cons tend to listen to Orbital Digital, as many of them have learning difficulties. I should add, the reason I was able to visit him was because of a pioneering operation which enabled me to walk again because they replaced my spine with a new one made of carbon fibre, which is actually the material they use in the engine blocks and chassis for Formula One cars. It's actually lighter than aluminium. Yours sincerely, Deirdre. P.S. Uh, unfortunately, I can't remember what our favourite song was. Ah, what a sad story. OK, um, now, uh, t uh, please do keep your calls, texts and faxes uh, coming in on uh, today's big question, which is, how often should you wash your towels? Uh, Ted in Wisbeck has been in touch. I don't use towels. I use a hairdryer set on cool. It takes a bit longer, but it feels lovely. And I finish off with a little talc for my testes and bum. Mmm, lovely stuff. As the Dalai Lama says, the show must go on. Ah, uh, yeah, you cock a snook at bad news, don't you? I, I do, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm a snook cocker. I'm sure there's an anagram in there somewhere. What? Huh? Hmm? Hmm? Just, I'm just saying, I'm sure there's an anagram in there somewhere. Oh. Doesn't matter. Press on. Introduce your next guest. Calling me that? Not an anagram. Simon Denton there. Funny Simon Denton. Yes. What's fascinating about history is that unlike bread in a bakery or love in a marriage, it's never going to run out. But military history is a genre all of its own. A new series promises to shed light on battlefield ingenuity and we'll be talking to its presenter, Sam Chatwin, very shortly. Hello. Shortly. But first, since military history is a subject close to my heart, I thought I'd don my wellies and shed a bit of light on one of my favourite battles. Let's take a look at my report. A simple stream in North Walsham, Norfolk. But six centuries ago, this stream would have flowed with the blood and entrails of fallen men. I was hoping to illustrate it by pouring in this bucket of butcher's waste. But some Dilbert at the council seems to think it would contaminate the water supply. So close your eyes instead and imagine bits of dead men bobbing about in red water. This was the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, caused, some say, by underpaying the workers. But there's compelling evidence that low wages actually increases productivity. As Kirsty Allsop says, a well-fed dog is a slow dog. Whatever the pros and cons, there can be no excuse for the peasants' antisocial behaviour. The execution of their ringleaders serving as a timely reminder that laws are there for a reason. Behind me is North Walsham Heath. What today is a pleasant place to rest was once a peasant place of rest, since many of them lay dying here. You see, razzed up on scrumpian injustice, they brought to the battle only guts and aggression. And as anyone who's played squash against Adrian Childs will tell you, guts and aggression are no match for skill and tactics, unless his opponents had a big breakfast. The battle was bloody. After the first day, the bishop's men set up camp here on the heath place for the pooped troops to regroup and recoup. They would have discussed the tactics with a free hot meal included. There were potatoes in those days, of course, they hadn't been developed. It was simply lamb shank or the classic chicken. In contrast, one can picture the peasants loaded on cider, weeing into bushes, telling disgusting jokes before attacking the bishop's men in dawn raids. But the lack of organisation meant they were no match for the deft sorcerership and combat nurse of a trained unit. <laughs> the labourers were serfs, their hands more used to drawing milk from a goat teat than wielding a sword. The trained soldiers knew to have one hand on the hilt, the other on the pummel. That is what I do. <laughs> I've got kids. <laughs> Continued. The bishop's men fighting off futile frenzy and sometimes rubbish attacks from the peasants. The battle continued till dusk. The last 
of the rebels dispatched had a bloody defeat that could have been avoided if the peasants had simply raised their concerns through the correct channels. <laughs> a sobering reminder that war, be it the First World War, the Second World War, or the Great War of China, always takes a heavy toll. We've been fighting. And I was the winner.